Today we have Karen Collins, who's going to be talking about Beverly Gates Snodgrass, um, who is like the Duke of Okanagan. Yes. A lot of people haven't really heard about William Snodgrass and that um, he was a very important person in Oklahoma Falls. But the first time that he really sort of, you know, interested me was probably 30 or 40 years ago. And in the Penticton Museum, they actually had at that point in time, the town plaque for Okanagan Falls. And because my uh, my mother grew up in Okanagan Falls. My grandfather grew up in Okanagan Falls. Um, I have a, a real connection with um, that town. And for me to see this town plaque, um, where at that point in time in the 1890s, really, um, William Snodgrass had projected that Penticton was going to be second to Okanagan Falls. Okanagan Falls was going to be, you know, the most important place in the valley as far as uh, transportation and um, with the railway having having the lake and he you know he did have a wonderful wonderful idea of what could be so he was a promoter and he was truly an entrepreneur so he was called the Duke of Okanagan Falls but really the only place that it turns up is in the book the, the Valley of Youth that was written by uh, Charles W. Holiday. And, you know, he really wrote this great um, sort of description of, of who he felt Snodgrass was during a road trip he was making through the Okanagan Valley. And the book that he published came out in 1948. So of course, much later than when things were really happening in Okanagan Falls, and, you know, he, he as part of um, describing Snodgrass, he also claimed to have seen him sitting at the gas station, which at that point in time was on the corner in Okanagan Falls, where you turn at the light, and that little location has always been a store or a garage in Okanagan Falls. And, of course, um, for different reasons, at that point in time, uh, when Snodgrass was there, there was no garage. So he was, um, he was born in uh, College Hill, Ohio, which is just north of Cincinnati. And he was born in a, in a farming family. And so just in kind of trying to understand who he was and where he came from can give us an idea of why he had such amazing plans for Okanagan Falls. This is a, a rendering of the Cincinnati Riverfront in 1829. And, you know, he came to the Okanagan in 1891. So this is what, this was what actually came before him. So you can kind of get an idea of uh, why he thought all things were possible. And also in, in 1827, they actually opened the Erie Canal, which allowed um, the area to have transportation as far south as New Orleans, so there again, that was a, that was another um, sort of impetus for uh, Snodgrass to think that what was done in his home area could happen elsewhere. So he's very interesting. He was the he was called the Duke of Okanagan Falls, but as I was researching him, what I found was that there were a lot of little discrepancies in different uh, facets of his life. In 1861, he um, enlisted and he was a private. Um, he enlisted in April and he um, mustered out in August. So he was there for a total of three months. He was only 18, so it could have been his age that that, that was the decision, you know, why he wasn't kept on or didn't stay on. Um, but then, oh, there we go. When I, when I was looking um, 
later on in his life to try and see what might have happened with his military career. The interesting thing is that he's listed as a private, but someone has written a lieutenant above it. So I don't think that very many people actually become a lieutenant in three months, but it is written on there. So, I mean, he, he was a person who was not without little controversies. He, being raised in, in College Hill, um, he also attended Farmers College and Farmers College um, operated right through the, the Civil War and actually later served as a, a military college until 1958. So, you know, there again, he was living in, in a um, much more um, developed area than what he was coming to. He also attended Lane Seminary and that was a part of the Presbyterian Church. And actually Lane Sem Seminary um, was really noted for the fact that um, there was a, a real, you know, and you think back in, in these early years, there was a, a protest by the students because they were not allowed to discuss slavery. Um, and so that, that, that was probably one of the things that also impacted his life. In, in a diary, which this is from genealogy notes, um, his brother wrote that uh, Will came, the 12th of May, Will came home from Lane Seminary and he reported, he received orders to report at Omaha City. Um, then he came home, left, and as you see, there are just different little comments. And then um, it said that he, on the 12th of October, so a few months later, he sent a, a letter to Will at the, the Dells in Oregon, which was the end of the Oregon Trail. So, and that was when the diary entries ended for the brother, but also that seems to have been kind of the last connection that he actually had with his family. So this is, this is Oregon. So you can see that just about where uh, the end is on uh, Oregon is where the Dalles is. Right over on the right-hand side at the top is the Union County. And that is actually where he ended up because at that point in time when he arrived, and I would imagine like, you know, so many other young fellows, the idea that they had discovered gold as well as other minerals in the area was, you know, really appealing to him. Although um, there were different areas in Oregon that did well with mining, uh, Oregon County was not one of them. And so it really became a farming and logging area. So then he ended up marrying, uh, in 1867, he ended up marrying the daughter of a uh, policeman from uh, Portland. And it, that, that, it, then they went to live in a little place called Oradell, which was in Union County. And it eventually became uh, a part of La Grand Oregon, which is, is much better known. And things really moved fast for William because by, um, you know, 1867, um, so, you know, not that long after he had left home because you were thinking that he left um, Cincinnati and, and Ohio in 1864. By 1867, he was the postman at Oradell. And this was an area where there were numerous uh, grist mills and sawmills in the area. And basically he had a sawmill. Um, there was a, a, a store that he had as well. And at this point in time, because he was developing so many things in this tiny little town, he became known as the Merchant Prince of Oradell, or Grand Ronde, I should say, which is the valley that Oradell was in. And he and his wife went on to have a lot of kids. And um, they ended up having 11 children and they eventually moved from uh, Oradell into La Grande because La Grande was, was uh, booming then. It was, much, it was much like Okanagan Falls in that he had started out in this little village that he thought was, had great hope. And it would be like moving from Okay Falls to Penticton because you found that things were happening there a little bit more. But 
this is an ad that he had. He had um, a sawmill and he, you know, cut all kinds of lumber and building materials and slash and door. He really was um, quite an amazing businessman. And at the same time, um, there was a lot of water power. And so there were a lot of grist mills. And so there again, that's, you know, kind of a connection to Okanagan Falls because um, Snodgrass actually erected a dam across the river that, you know, with a fall of 16 feet. And so he, he was never afraid to try anything. And he did try an awful lot of different um, businesses and, um, you know, did a lot to improve the areas that he went to. His wife, his wife, um, I might have got this one here. Oh, sorry, this one is a little early. But in 1900, he was in Okanagan Falls. His wife was still in, uh, this, in the States. And you can see that she's got all of, all of the kids and she was um, still looking after sort of the, the home fires in Oregon. This is the area that they, they lived in. This is from 1894. So you can see that in 1894, he was in Okanagan Falls trying to develop things. This is what it looked like in La Grande, Oregon, which is where he lived. It was you know, much um, more developed than what it was here. And uh, you know, it was really more like where he had come from in Cincinnati. There was lots of housing, lots of industry. You know, there were a lot of large buildings. It was, it was a city. And this is another picture that just kind of shows exactly the, you know, what it looked like from different uh, viewpoints. He had five sons, um, as you can see from different uh, ages. Um, two of his sons actually came to Canada with him. They one son lived in Okanagan Falls and the other ended up living in Greenwood. He ended up being lured to, to Penticton by Tom Ellis. And Tom Ellis, um, after acquiring the uh, Haynes estate, ended up going down, he went, he went on a sales trip and he happened to be down in Portland and became acquainted with Snodgrass because he was looking for people to come north and invest and helped to develop the area. And so of course, Snodgrass, even though he had just gone through some losses um, because he had made a, a loan to somebody that had, had not uh, panned out and so and because he was the one who had you know, provided the capital, he was the one who took the hit. It didn't stop him from being interested in what Tom Ellis was telling him. And in the spring of 1892, he did visit Okanagan Falls and obviously thought that, you know, there was a lot of potential here because he really saw a booming metropolis in Okanagan Falls. When he came to Okanagan Falls uh, and he was really the, the uh, main person behind the syndicate and he was the only one to ever come to Okanagan Falls. Um, this is an, a newspaper uh, write up an ad that he had, um, put out there showing that, you know, Okanagan Falls was a new city. You know, it's, it's never been a city, but it was going to be one. And it was going to be the most important dis distribution point for the Okanagan Valley and the Kettle River country as well. And uh, Mr. Holman, who's on here, was obviously one of his um, uh, investors because he, he appeared in Okanagan Falls and you know, play different roles in uh, the development as it, as it went along with uh, W.J. Snodgrass. And, and this is just in October, 1893. So he had, he had come you know, the spring before and you know, the dwelling house and store with the proposed war facilities, which Mr. Snodgrass has in the course of uh, creation presented that, you know, Mr. Grant looked over the finest buildings in the village, in the town. And uh, there were also, you know, people really, you know, kind of jumped on it because they weren't crazy about the fact that he was an American. 
And, you know, so they really had high expectations from him. So, you know, some of the things that were in the news, like, is, you know, like, so when are you going to do something with the dam, you know, and with the water park? When are you going to build the new bridge? Um, there were all kinds of um, people who were really pushing him to do more faster in developing the area. And this is an early photograph of Okanagan Falls. And you can see the wonderful buildings and the dock that he built, because these would be Snodgrass's buildings here. And then that's the first bridge that went into Okanagan Falls during that time. And of course it went right over the falls. He did everything. He, you know, he built a hotel, he built a store, he built stables, he built the wharf. He went out and he was the person who hired the school teacher. And he went down to the coast and hired a school teacher for $50 a month. And this is a picture of the early, um, an early class in Okanagan Falls. And I'm proud to say that that cute little guy in the white shirt holding on to his hat in the front, that's my grandpa. This is another picture of the early development of Okanagan Falls. This is probably after 1906 because you can see the Alexandra Hotel there. Um, you know, but it was still um, really undeveloped, but it was still seen as, you know, kind of a place to be. This is a really interesting article that uh, Gary happened to find in the archives and, and, and gave to me because in, in uh, well, with his idea of having more transportation and being able to have uh, work with the, with the railways and, and bring um, goods, he really planned on using the lake. And so he was the one who actually first tried to straighten out and make it easier and get rid of all of the... Uh, unevenness and the rock and everything else in the river channel so that his boats could go through from Okanagan to Skaha. And this article, although it's a later article, it does tell about that all being done. And, uh, you, you know, he had, to, he, it even talks about the fact that, uh, you know, some of the goods that were taken to Okanagan Falls, like the Clary stoves and, and uh, you know, it, it it's really nice that there are these newspaper articles that you know suddenly will turn up and they kind of verify what you know or what you hope you know. Um, so in the spring of 1893, he purchased a small steamer called the Miramachi. And that was the, the first one that he had because, and he was actually gonna use it um, to take his own uh, construction materials down to Okanagan Falls as well. And, uh, there's a lot that isn't known about it because, um, you know, there, there's, there's no evidence even of, of whatever happened to that little, that little steamboat. Um, but, it was, but it was there and it was, the, it was the first. So his two sons, Joe and John, came to, to live with him uh, in the area and he formed the Pentagon Stage Line. The Penticton stage line ran from Penticton to the boundary area um, and it ran twice a week. And that is a picture of their stage line there. Um, so you can see that he, you know, he had all kinds of offers for them because, uh, and one thing about W.J. Snodgrass, even back in those days, he advertised a lot. This is another picture of um, their stage outside the Windsor Hotel in Greenwood. And uh, he ended up losing his, his son, John, who had lived in Okanagan Falls. He passed away in 1907. He was only 32, but he had pneumonia. And uh, this was just a few months after he had lost one of his little children. So it was a real loss at that point in time for WJ. Who was very, he was very much a family man. This is a picture of Greenwood at that point in time. So you can see that even Greenwood was more developed than Okanagan Falls at the time. 
Um, while, we, while they were involved in Greenwood, he also um, built a steam laundry. And his steam laundry was going to be the biggest and the best, and it was going to more than, uh, be more than adequate for the entire town. Uh, the sad thing is, is that in his advertising, and he did advertise a lot, um, he did a lot of negative advertising towards the Chinese laundries. And, um, you know, it's kind of like karma. He had opened this and he claimed to have the latest in technology and, and it was going to be run by absolute experts. His son-in-law, um, Mr. Abbott, was going to be the, the manager of uh, the laundry. And uh, after running for a very short time, they had issues with drainage and the water exchange and the Board of Health shut them down. And even, you know, even two or three years later, he was still was hopeful that he was gonna get his laundry going, but it never ever did amount to anything. And this is, an, this is the only picture that I could find of the Maud Moor. And it was also purchased by uh, Snodgrass and, and Maud Moor being, named for his daughter. And originally when he had it, because this, this shows it when, after he had sold it to uh, Robinson um, for in, in Aramata, he used it for you know, his own use and ran it as a little fairy for a while. But um, I think I've got there. You can see it if you really look. Um, and you can see that the, the front of it, that the, um, the steerage house is, looks really top heavy and that was one of the problems with it and it, it really didn't do well um, on the lake um, because it, it, it just wasn't uh, stable enough. But you can see that it, it was there at the docks and, and uh, you know. Oh, let me see, can I, whoops, right there. There, that little tiny thing. That was it, yes, yeah. You see, I know where it is, so I, I would have think to point it out, right? He also got involved in local politics and um, he was um, very involved um, with, the, with the Liberal Party and um, he actually was nominated twice in 1900, he was nominated to run against Price Ellison and uh, backed out at the last minute, mainly because he was not a Canadian citizen at the time. And that was a bit sticky. Um, then, you know, the, the Liberals weren't going to give up on him. They, they nominated, him, nominated him a second time in 1903. And then he was going to run against L.W. Shafford. And um, at the last minute, um, he was convinced to step down because there was a there was a lot of um, a lot of um, how do I put it nicely? They really believed in him because he knew how to talk. And one of the things that they claimed in the newspapers was the fact that he had been a part of. Um, the Senate in, in Oregon, and he had been very involved in US politics. And the truth is that he had been a, a counselor, a city councilor for eight years in uh, the Grand, Oregon, as well as sitting on the, the school board. But that was the extent of his political career in the state. But in coming to Canada, bigger is better. And uh, there was really the assumption that he you know, was, was this really experienced politician. He had run for the Senate um, in Oregon and lost the first time by 32 votes. And the second time there was a whole um, set of circumstances that, uh, you know, he missed out on Congress. So he, he did try. He never gave up trying, but it, it never, he never really had a political career. And this is another picture of, um, of LeGrand. And he uh, had become he had become ill. He was he was really ill in the last year that he was in the area, 
and he was spending a lot of time in the States. And that's something that was actually true of his entire time in Okinawa Falls is that he was constantly going back and forth between uh, Canada and the US. He always kept his hand in on everything that was happening in Oregon as well. Um, and, and so then he, he ended up, because his health was so bad, he had decided that um, it was time to, and I think losing his son and, and little grandchild, that um, it was time that um, he gave up his dream in Okanagan Falls. And so then he ended up selling all of his assets to James Ritchie from Tleden. And in these two pictures, um, we know who three of the people are. We don't know who the fourth is. And I really think that given the fact that James Ritchie was the only person who owned a car in the Valley at that time, that um, he is the person who is on the right in, in, uh, in both pictures. Um, the driver um, is obviously Dick Weeks is driving for him because the wheel is, is on the other side. It's not as it is today. So given the fact that uh, WJ had his dream of Okanagan Falls, and I, I wish we had the plant because he had a hospital, he had a university, he had major industrial area, all of the streets were named. He had this dream of what was going to be and, and it just ne it never happened. And he ended up um, after leaving Okanagan Falls um, on his way home. He was at the Empress in Victoria and had a stroke. And basically that, you know, that was the end of um, his time here. This is a picture that you can see with the roads crisscrossing the picture that that is the area that the pictures were taken in the car. So you can see Peach Cliff in the back. And uh, you can see that it, after all of his years being there, because he'd come in 1892, this is in 1909, and it really hasn't developed all that much. In, in Oregon, for his passing, uh, obituaries abounded. Uh, the newspapers absolutely loved him. He was at that, you know, in those, he was the grand old man of, of Union County. Um, so all the way through, he had different, uh, especially on the American side, he had all of these nicknames that followed him. And uh, he, you know, there again, it, I don't know if it's just because of the way that the newspapers put things, but they, they said that he was a, a lifelong um, member of the county. They really didn't say anything about his time in Okanagan Falls and, and the dreams that he had and what he had hoped to do and all that he did. Because, you know, when you think about the fact that almost single-handedly he tried to build a town and he just couldn't get the support. Um, and it really, what, you know, there were different uh, reasons why it was never going to happen. So this is where they, this is another story where they talk about the grand old man of Union County. And, and like I say, he was, you know, he was absolutely loved in Canada and, and more specifically in the boundary country because they had newspapers going at that time, as well as the closest one being the, the Headley Gazette. They didn't even mention the fact that he had passed. So, you know, I, I, find, I found it, you know, really, really sad that here was a man who did so much for one little town and really has never been recognized. And so uh, that's just a little bit more about uh, who William J. Snowgrass is. So thank you.